I'm not doing it. The figure, black on black, stopped and turned. His face was blank, and Sentinel had a hard time deciphering the man's features as anything but generic. But his body language was clear annoyance. Major, the man sighed. What about your position has ever made you think that you have a say in what you do? Sentinel didn't answer directly. Instead, he asked another question. Yes or no, Ares is currently one of the top Eclipse Initiative teams. I don't see how that's yes or no. He leveled Sentinel with a look, but eventually admitted, You've lost a few members, but... Your returns from the missions that you've been assigned are far and above the most interesting and useful to Umbral as of late. What is your point? You keep sending us into these death traps, but at the same time, consider my team to be valuable? Send somebody else this time. That makes little to no sense. Your team has already been in this area, are familiar with what was found there and have an established relationship with the expert that you're supposed to be escorting. There is no other team suited to the job, Major. Crossing his arms, Sentinel leaned back against the lockers, considering his next move, as soon as the Umbral agent had cornered him in the locker room after a workout. He knew that he wasn't going to like whatever bullshit Umbral had planned for his team this time around. That was what they did approached him with the mission briefing somewhere that he couldn't argue, couldn't get away to think. There were other Umbral employees milling around the area, and he wasn't about to make a scene, no matter how much this new assignment pissed him off. We are two men short from the last time we were at Viridian, and you still haven't assigned us a new cybersecurity expert. Hawkeye was imperative to us getting out of there alive last time, but we can't have him posted up in a sniping position if he's still acting as our tech guy. And the agent held up a hand, and Sentinel clamped his mouth shut, swallowing down his annoyance to listen to what the other man had to say. You won't be going to the lab specifically, but we'll be investigating the surrounding areas. A sniper shouldn't be necessary for this assignment. Also, you didn't lose any of your team members at Viridian Labs, so there really isn't any reason for you to try and reject this job. You know that if you cause trouble, Ares will just be disbanded, and all of you will be assigned to different teams, right? We just fucking got back from Haven and- The agent seemed to raise himself to his full height, and his generic face became even harder to concentrate on. It sent a thread of cold through Sentinel. You're going, Major. You and the entirety of your team. There has to be something we can do to make accepting this assignment less difficult for you, so what is it? Sentinel swallowed and thought about the weight of his second-in-command in his arms. There is one thing. Are you sure we can't bring everyone else? He looked down at Aegis, dressed in dark green, sterile scrubs, her pale hair scraped into a tight bun on the top of her head. No, it was hard as hell to get these permissions. Then why me? The medic had a million questions, which he understood. After all, he had only collected her 45 minutes ago, and she'd barely had time to process what was going on. You, him, and Jester wrecked together for years before I was added on. Aegis. He blew out a long breath, fighting to find the words to explain it all to her. It wasn't like he could tell her that he could see every day the weight that his loss had on her, or the way her confidence had faded with each passing week, or even that he had nightmares, something that rarely happened to him, that consisted of nothing but her voice grating out the name Roderick or the imprint of her knees in the ice made bloody from the hole in Cypher's head, where she had knelt to try and save Raptor's life. Jester would have loved to see him, and Sentinel knew that, but it didn't weigh on his soul like it did on Aegis's, if the demolitions expert even had one left, which was probably the best case. 
Sentinel didn't think he himself had a soul to speak of either. Jester doesn't need this. You do. It wasn't the answer she wanted. Her lips thinned, and she stared straight ahead at the steel elevator wall. You don't have to handle me with kid gloves. That's not what I'm doing. If you don't want to go, then fine, but... She cut him off. I do. I want to go. Good. So do I. There was still tension in the air. How couldn't there be? With what they were going to do. But Aegis did her best to break it. At least somewhat. Green is your color, she told her commander, referencing the scrubs that he too had been forced to wear. Thanks. Wish I could say the same for you. Aegis snorted, and Sentinel held back a laugh. It would be the last shred of amusement either of them felt for a while. The elevator doors whooshed open, and there was a solemn nurse there to greet them. The basement hospital wing was painfully bright, everything pristine white and shining steel. It was a large, windowless area, but Sentinel knew there were only ever ten patients on the floor at any given time. It was reserved for the most severe cases that Umbral had under their umbrella, or the ones that needed to be quarantined. The nurse didn't speak to them as she led them through the corridors. There weren't any of the softening measures that might be found at a civilian hospital. No artwork, gentle music, or signs of hope. It was utilitarian, and empty in a way he didn't like. The further they walked, the more Sentinel second-guessed himself. Even requesting to see his teammate had probably set off alarm bells with the higher-ups at the Eclipse Initiative. Friendships, and any kind of interactions outside of work, weren't exactly encouraged, but they were tolerated for successful, veteran teams like Ares. Concern, though, was a different story. It was an indication of a bond that was above and beyond a simple workplace friendship, or the connection between soldiers. Umbral didn't want them to be worried about each other, or to really care, because that would inevitably mess with their abilities to work as emotionless, robotic individuals. He had told himself at first that the silent damage done to his team after the Seed Vault mission had been because they lost two members, traumatically, all at once. That if it had just been only Cypher, or only Raptor, that it wouldn't have affected them at all. Sentinel was lying to himself, of course, but it was easier to tell himself that instead of admitting that Ares had the potential to fall apart, ironically, because their bonds were so tight. Was it because he was a weak leader? Or was there some other reason? As soon as he asked to see Raptor, Sentinel knew that he couldn't deny anymore that he wasn't affected by the loss of his second-in-command. It was a confession that Raptor hadn't been just a placeholder. At that point, all he could do was hope that he made the right call, and that seeing her injured teammate would help center Aegis once more. Getting her back to her full capacity was worth the risk. Another thing that set his teeth on edge about Umbral's quarantine facility was the fact that there was no privacy. There were no separate rooms or curtains, just glass walls where everyone passing by could see the person suffering there in the hospital bed. There were only eight in the facility today, but so far they had passed five miserable faces, broken bodies, shattered spirits, and some closer to dead than alive. It made some thread of fury roll up his spine, thinking about the indignity that Raptor must feel on display like that. Sentinel considered trying his luck and seeing if he had enough clout to get his teammate a private room, but considering the way everyone was looking at him and Aegis as they passed, he knew he was probably pushing his luck already. There was a single whiteboard on the glass cubicle that made up Raptor's room, and it read, Sergeant Gideon, Acute Radiation Poisoning, Level 4. He and Aegis could both see the tall frame of their friend in the bed, uncovered, and Sentinel heard his medic suck in a shocked, aggravated breath before she caught herself and her professional veneer fell back over her like a suit of armor. 
They were still too far from him to determine if Raptor was awake. But just seeing that he really was alive was a punch in the gut. It didn't seem real until right then. Sure, he had been told by Umbral that Raptor had survived, but he was already falling apart when Sentinel pulled him above ground back in Svalbard. How could he have made it? Yet, there he was. Aegis was talking quietly to their nurse escort, too softly for Sentinel to hear, and the sounds of the machines around them were becoming louder and louder, until it was the only thing he could perceive. Then, finally, Aegis came back to his side, and the nurse walked over to hit the intercom next to the sliding glass door that led into Raptor's clear room. He's conscious, Aegis told him, and is pretty much himself from what she says. I believe it's when I see it. How long did they give us? Ten minutes. And we can't go in. She thins her lips. Let's make it count, I guess. Major Delacroix and Corporal Alvarez, here to see you, the nurse said into the intercom, and the still form of Raptor stirred. Sentinel and Aegis walked to the glass, as close to his bed as they could, and looked on as he tried to raise himself to his elbows. Raptor quickly gave up the effort, and simply turned his face to them, hitting a button on the side of his cot to raise his upper half to almost sitting. Aegis didn't flinch, and her expression didn't show shock, only kind warmth. It was her healer face. He'd seen it enough times to know, and Sentinel knew there was probably a storm brewing somewhere inside. For once, he took her lead, and kept his expression in check. That didn't mean he wasn't shaken, though. Raptor had been tall, muscular, and undeniably in the prime of his life. He had a smile that was brilliantly white, and warm, brown skin marred here and there by the scars that so many soldiers wore. When he had handed his second over to the Umbral medics, Raptor had been a sick shade of mud gray, that had turned Sentinel's stomach. Now, he was thin, gaunt even. There was a pallor to his color, but he wasn't gray anymore, thank Christ. But when Raptor, dressed only in a loose-fitting pair of hospital pants, turned his head to look at the two of them, Sentinel noticed something odd. There were portions of his skin, his cheeks, part of his chest, his lower ribs around his stomach, that didn't catch the light like the rest of him did. It was dull and matte, and he swore that there was a pattern to every inch of him, both natural and matte, like a hexagonal grid. Sentinel only saw it for a tiny piece of a second, and when he blinked, the pattern was gone. Maybe he imagined the last part. He couldn't dwell on it anyway. Not with the look in Raptor's eyes. A tired, heavy relief. None of them could dream of calling their commander anything but his codename, especially in front of others. But Sentinel let it slide when Raptor opened his mouth and said, Nathaniel, Alicia. His voice was barely familiar, like the crinkling of dry leaves. But it was still him. And by using their real names, he told them, without saying anything else, human to human, my friends... I'm glad you're here. Fuck. Get it under control. Don't react. <clears throat> Good to see you, Sentinel replied. Raptor, Aegis said, surprising both men. A tenseness passed over Raptor's expression, surprised that the medic, his savior, had fallen back on his codename so quickly. But the tension was there and gone in an instant. I'm... Sorry it's taken us so long to get down here. That's all right. There wasn't much of me to see into lately. He inhaled slowly, a million unspoken things hovering there. Instead, though, Raptor asked, So, I heard that you two had to sleep over with an underwater cult. Despite himself, Sentinel smirked. Yeah, you could say that. You want a quick rundown? Hell yes, I do. Anything is better than staring at nothing all day. All right, 
I think we can manage that. The staff in the quarantine ward gave them more than ten minutes. Sentinel and Aegis didn't rush their story either. If anything, they dragged it out as long as possible. It was vulnerable and raw, even when they laughed. For the first 24 hours after he was told what he was going to have to do to pay for his life being saved, Howard Brighton considered simply killing himself to escape. The following day, he decided he didn't want to die, but that those umbral assholes were going to have to have him in a straitjacket if they wanted to get him on the plane back to South America. And then the next, Chimera stopped talking to him. The silence threatened to make him lose his mind. It was beyond any sort of pain he had felt being burned to the bone by white phosphorus, beyond any fear he might have felt when Chimera first started speaking in his mind. He had gotten so used to the second presence in his mind that it felt like half his body was gone when Chimera went silent. It wasn't like the alien had been speaking any sort of sense, but there was a desperate, searching feeling to its tendrils in his mind. There were days he thought Chimera wanted to own him. Others were sure it couldn't wait to kill him. But most of all, Chimera didn't want to be alone. So when Howard finally was alone, he found the reality of it distasteful. That wasn't the only weird thing happening to him either. Umbral didn't give him any time alone, but every third or so guard he would be given was off. The strange behavior had been something he could write off at the beginning, but when one of the guards leaned over his shoulder and whispered his name over and over, it was a bridge too far. Still weak, he spent his nights in the hospital wing. On some nights, when he woke up to seek out the restroom or a cold drink, he was positive he saw clusters of nurses and doctors in the corners of the dark hallways, all standing in a semicircle and all humming. So, Chimera was silent. Umbral agents and medical professionals were acting strange, and Howard was being told that he would be going back to the place that had nearly been his grave. But that was the extent of information that he was trusted with. His bioprinted skin itched like mad, baby pink against the tanner skin of the rest of his body covering where he had been burnt so severely he should have died from shock alone. But his body didn't reject it, which was a miracle, and his arm that had been all but destroyed was, for the most part, whole. Sensation wasn't perfect, and it was pathetically weak, but it was there. And Umbral made him one more promise, if he was able to help Ares succeed on their next assignment. A bionic eye to fill the empty socket in his head. Depth for his sight once more. It wasn't enough of a draw at first, but when everything else started to add to it, the eyes started to sound better and better. That, and from what he could tell, none of the Ares members he would be with had whatever mental issue was affecting some of the other Umbral employees. There was a large part of him that would still rather die than go back to Viridian, but the part that wanted to live, and the part that wanted to know why Chimera had left him, was louder. So, Howard boarded the plane heading for South America with Ares, and hours later, the SB-1 Defiant, the same one that had pulled him out of the jungles months earlier. He let them dress him in body armor, and sat between the terrifying soldiers as the chopper blades cut through the air, taking him home. Jester found himself gripping the edges of his seat as the SB-1 roared through the skies above the dense South American jungle. Sweat prickled on his forehead as he watched the towering trees rush by, their branches appearing dangerously close as the pilot brought them in. There was no reason to hike in like they did last time. There was no need for secrecy. He clenched his teeth, the wind whipping through the open cockpit door. The afternoon sun cast fleeting flashes of light and shadow over the dense foliage, creating a dizzying play of patterns that made his head spin. There was something about this assignment he didn't like, and it started with fucking Howard. 
sitting there, all slouched over, wringing his soft hands. It was hard to focus, but he tried. The earthy smell of the jungle mingled with the dampness of the air, but instead of grounding him, it just made Jester feel like he was an intruder. The jungle hadn't felt this ominous the first time around, but he just couldn't pinpoint what was different. No one was talking either. All he could hear was the clicks from the pilot adjusting the controls and the occasional crackle of the radio. That, and the insistent wind. Through the open door, a river glimmered like a silver serpent amidst the sea of green. The aircraft pressed on, and the landscape shifted. The trees grew taller and more imposing, casting elongated shadows that seemed to reach out for the SB-1. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, his eyes locked on the horizon as the remnants of the Viridian Laboratory came into view. The once orderly buildings now lay in ruins, a stark contrast to what it had been before. The lab had been broken down when they had first come, but now it was nothing but rubble and ash. He could see the shattered walls and the twisted metal, a haunting reminder of the forces that had torn through the laboratory. Chimera. Even the air seemed to carry a ghostly whisper, a reminder of the secrets that now lay buried beneath the debris. He reached inside himself for humor, but found very little. Jester could feel himself getting lost in his own head, and that just wasn't going to work for him. If he couldn't keep his spirits up on his own, he'd have to reach out to another team member to make it happen. Good thing there was always an easy target. Tempest. Her helmet and mask already on. Her spine ramrod straight. Jester pushed his own gas mask up over his helmet. Psst. Tempest. Is this your first? She ignored him. So did everyone else. What a bunch of losers. Jester leaned back in his seat and refused to drop the joke. It's just so cool that you're allowed your first babysitting job. I'm sure Howard will be good for you. Especially if you read him a bedtime story. Ares continued to ignore Jester, besides the red that he could see creeping up Tempest's neck under her mask. But the biologist alongside them wasn't as easily deterred. I know, you think that's funny. He drawled, his voice slightly distorted by the way the scarred half of his mouth pulled. But I'm one of the top exobiologists on the planet and blatant disrespect is not needed nor appreciated. Jester, who in his own field could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the exobiologist any day, just grinned. Well, sorry, sir. I'll try to remember who exactly I'm in the presence of. Howard had to raise his voice to be heard over the propellers. Do you think I want to be here? Going back to this place? You acting like a frat boy is just rubbing salt in the wound. I have to give you credit, man. For as fucking helpless you are, you've got balls. Howard's upper lip curled, but he didn't say anything else. It was a decent distraction, but Jester still didn't feel like himself. Ares felt put together like a bad game of Tetris, technically fitting, but leaving a lot of gaps. Right. Let's go over the assignment one more time before we land. Sentinel spoke up, breaking the awkwardness. Umbral has reason to believe that something in the Viridian Lab ruins is altering the local flora and fauna. After losing some of the civilian recovery crews they hired, Umbral sent in an Eclipse recovery specialist team, and they didn't come back either. Tempest grunted. Which team? Wings, Sentinel said, sparing a look at Howard and adding, Warfront Intelligence and Navigation Ground Specialists. There were six of them, and it should have been plenty to finish cataloging the site. They lost contact after three days, and haven't heard from them since. Their tracking implants are still active, but Umbral reports they have been moving erratically, and in nonsensical patterns. So one possibility is that there is some electromagnetic interference in the area. Our job is to go in and find out what happened to Wings, but also retrieve any samples they collected before they went radio silent. 
Wings reported a lot of changes in the wildlife and plant life in the area, which is why Howard is with us. Before Howard had joined them, Sentinel had told the rest of the team the second reason the exobiologist was with them. It was because there was a thought among some of the doctors that took care of Howard that he might retain some sort of connection with Chimera. And, despite how much none of them wanted to deal with the extraterrestrial anymore, its hypothetical fingerprints were all over what was happening at the Viridian site. Extract any Living Eclipse Initiative members, and retrieve anything notable. We're considering this a dangerous assignment, so we're going in hot. Take no chances, especially with Howard. Got it? They all gave him the affirmative as the chopper began its circular descent. As always, the instructions were painfully, ridiculously vague, but at this point he was used to it. Jester carried his usual gear as well as the ampule launcher he had brought to Viridian the first time around. They were going to be in the forest for the majority of the job, so he wasn't sure how useful he was going to be this time around. But Jester had a feeling that things were going to range between interesting and screwed up beyond recognition. It was never a dull day being part of Ares. Jester felt the heat hit him like a slap in the face the second he stepped out of the chopper. Behind his gas mask, he sucked in air, desperate for the go-ahead to take the damned thing off once it was confirmed the air was clear. It should be, considering they were just in the middle of a rainforest, and not someplace insane like a damn underwater habitat. But the last team had reported some sort of intangible barrier surrounding the area. The Defiant hadn't had any issues landing, so he thought it was probably bullshit. But he also wasn't looking to die an embarrassing, suffocating death. They took their positions, Sentinel on point, then Jester and Aegis, and bringing up the back were Hawkeye and Tempest. Sandwiched between his row and Hawkeye's was Howard, his own gas mask covering his round face. His gear was protective, but lacked the weaponry, bells, and whistles that the actual Ares members' uniforms had, and the poor guy moved like his body armor weighed a million pounds. He had a pack of all supplies he might need, basically a tiny mobile lab, but it had quickly been decided that Hawkeye would carry the thing. Howard wouldn't make it a mile if he had to. Not that he could blame him, really because this place reminded Jester why they called forests like this green infernos. The trees and vine work crawling above them were as inescapable as a wildfire, never ending and all consuming. Nature had even begun to take over what was left of Viridian already. Stones were covered in moss and kudzu, as if the greenery planned to break the rocks down into dirt once more just like they had been at the beginning of eternity. There was no sign of the civilian teams or wings either, as they cleared the area foot by miserable foot. Since the place had all but caved in, the basement laboratory where Chimera had been was full of debris and impossible to access. What was easy to reach, though, was the black, scorched earth where he and Hawkeye had burned the Chimera to the ground. Howard knelt, motioning Hawkeye over to give him his bag, and began to collect a few samples from the char. Ares formed a circle around the scientist, and he found himself next to Tempest, who was shifting from foot to foot, her Scorpion Evo SMG in her hands. He saw her stiffen when he started to talk, but she quickly went back to normal once she realized he wasn't being an ass for the second time in an hour. Have you noticed this barrier they warned us about? Tempest shook her head once. No. I think this might be a case of mass hysteria or something. Because besides the lab, there was nothing weird about this place last time we were here. Jester's voice was deadpan. Temp, we torched a fucking alien. I said besides the lab, she huffed. You know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah, I get it. So you think it was all mental then? 
the civilian teams and wings both. Like you just said, the Chimera thing was from another planet. Umbro might not say it out loud, but Howard over there has alluded to it pretty strongly. She jerks her head towards the exobiologist. The thing is, extraterrestrials are supposed to be brain-breaking, right? They fried all that Lovecraftian fear shit out of us during our training. She holds her finger to her temple and spins it in a circle. So we didn't panic when we saw it. At least not fully. But if there was something alien left behind, it might have cracked the minds of those other teams like a walnut, you know? Wings did the same training Ares did, he pointed out. That mental fortitude stuff they put us through was some of the most basic stuff for Umbral employees. Even Howard had it, I'm sure. So your explanation might work for the layman teams, but not Eclipse teams. I mean, sure, I guess, Tempest shrugged. We're kind of the best, though, right? Maybe we just handled it better. Jester just snorted, and he could sense Tempest's temper kicking up a notch. Okay, smartass. What do you think is going on? I got my theories, he declared, sounding intentionally aloof. But if I had to guess... Pollen. Oh, fuck off, Pollen. Seriously. If Chimera triggered some sort of evolutionary... Shit. Everyone whipped around to Howard, who was scrambling backwards from the burn piles, jerking his rubber gloves off frantically. I ate through it, he yelled. It ate through the gloves. The gloves were indeed black and disintegrating before their eyes. Aegis moved with quick, practice movements, her own gloved hands taking Howard's and pulling out a bottle of alcohol, dousing his fingers and palms with it until the astringent smell filled the air. Don't panic. The medic's voice was cool. She flipped his hands over, and Jester could see that on his newly healed hand, there wasn't even fingernails yet. It made him shudder. You look clean. Aegis assured him. Just do something more substantial next time. For a little outside of the realm of where vinyl is going to cut it. Sure. Howard was panting. Sure, okay. He tucked the samples he did have into his pack and handed it back to Hawkeye, standing on shaky legs. The sniper experimentally kicked at some of the burnt debris, but nothing happened. No movement. No reaching tendrils. Nothing. Ares cleared the Viridian site, what little was left of it, and Jester reminisced on the final fight there in the courtyard. He was almost screwed before Hawkeye, with Cypher beside him up in the sniper's nest, had saved his ass. It had been a good day, one of the best. They had emerged victorious and whole. He turned just enough to see Hawkeye out of his peripherals, anonymous behind his gas mask the barrel of his rifle visible over his shoulder. Chester was wondering if he was thinking about that day, too. It was morning when they were dropped off. Hawkeye didn't trust his mind as much as he used to, so when the morning bled straight into evening, he didn't think anything of it. Slipping through the hours was a sniper's bread and butter, and he had spent more hours than this, Days, sometimes, prone with his eye to the scope, which was why he didn't question the slippage of time. He simply assumed that, since they were finding not a single damned thing, that he had shifted into that waiting mode that he was so familiar with. And that wasn't an exaggeration. They weren't finding anything. When Howard had declared after some short testing that the air was fine, it was almost a religious experience to take the gas mask off. The air had felt so heavy, like a wet cloth was draped over his face. He was disappointed when he sucked in his first breath of unencumbered air, that it was nearly just as humid and soupy as before. At least he wasn't sucking in his own sweat and breath, though. Along with letting the hours pass by without notice, along with letting the hours pass by without notice, Hawkeye had also spent time letting every single type of bug and small creature crawl over him while he waited behind his scope. Part of being one of the best snipers in the field meant that he had a very specific way of melting into the natural world around him, 
becoming one with it. Because of those experiences, he didn't really notice when the thing started crawling over the toes of his boots, or when he had to drag his hand across his face to clear suspiciously thick spiderwebs. The others did, though. Maybe it was because he was the tallest, but Sentinel was the first one Hawkeye noticed pulling one of the spiders away from his neck. The thing seemed to cling to him like Velcro, and when he managed to get it off and throw it aside, the thing hissed. The sides of his palm in bile yellow, the spider hit the undergrowth and disappeared. Ares kept walking. They were following the same grid search that the previous teams had been supposed to complete, and they had two days to get it done. Howard slowed them down, but that had been accounted for. Dirt roads and access paths had been carved out of the area to service Viridian Labs better, and they more or less stuck to those when the terrain got too tough. That didn't mean that nature wasn't present in full force, though. Besides the bugs, small rodents skittered across their paths, and every once in a while, the long, sinewy rope of a snake would flee back into the deeper parts of the forest. He didn't give it a second thought. The howler monkeys, though. They were loud as hell. Black shadows in the branches, their calls monotonous, never changing. that echoed through the empty spaces and pressed against his eardrums. Although morning had passed straight into evening, the evening lingered on and on. It was strange enough that Hawkeye finally noticed, and he watched the sun hang on the horizon, never changing, for hours. No one else mentioned it, but it made the hair on the back of his neck stand up. Reaching back to rub away the goosebumps, his palm hit something chitinous and jerking. It hissed. Another damn spider. Hawkeye's nerves were frayed, and out of character he jolted, biting out a quiet shit as he tried to pry the thing off of him. With his gloves on, he wasn't afraid of a bite, but the hissing in his ears was so loud and violent that the reptilian part of his brain wanted to panic. The rest of the team stopped while he tried to pull it away where it gripped at the small, bare strip of his skin. One by one, the legs released, the spider flailing in his hands like a live wire. When the final one gave, he didn't toss it to the ground, but threw it as hard as he was able into a nearby tree trunk, a vomit-colored missile. It hit, but didn't die on impact. Instead. It shattered like glass in hundreds, if not thousands, of pieces. All of which then crawled away on their own, hissing in unison as they spread out in a wave. Shock reigned for long seconds, before Howard dove to the ground and fought to grab one of the living pieces, calling for Hawkeye to give him his pack. The sniper slid it down his shoulder and tossed it to the ground next to Howard having no interest in getting any closer than he had to whatever the hell he just pulled off himself. He was barely resisting the urge to claw at the back of his neck again, just to make sure nothing was left behind. It was the first clear signal that something was up. Howard managed to get a few of the things in a vial, and when he held them up to look at them closely, the spider pieces looked nothing more than spoiled yellow flecks of pepper. The exobiologist was enthusiastic, but none of the rest of the team was. Ares had seen too many things in their years together to be excited about any sort of novelty that could potentially kill them. It opened the door, though, for the sniper to speak up about the unmoving sun. If things were weird, he might as well bring attention to just how weird. Sentinel, he grunted trying and failing to figure out how to say this. The, uh, sun has been in the same place for hours. The commander turned to look at him. Hawkeye hadn't been too unsettled at first, but when he saw that Sentinel was spooked, he felt that frisson that usually meant something bad was going to happen. While no one spoke, the sound of buzzing insects grew and grew. I thought so. 
Sentinel finally admitted. Is everyone else observing the same thing? Agreement rippled through the group. Sentinel looked grim, but nodded. Okay. All of our times are synced, but just in case any electromagnetic interference fucks things up, let's set a failsafe. Everyone set a timer on your watches and your visor interfaces, and in four hours, we stop for the night, dark or not. Ares obeyed without question, but Howard whipped around to look at them all like they were insane. Charlie, you can't be serious. Time fluctuations. Enough, Hawkeye snapped. We don't question the commander. But... Tempest for once was on the same page as the sniper. We don't question the commander, he said. Howard's jaw snapped shut, and he said nothing more. They all started to move again, following a path meant for a different team, still looking for any signs of those who were lost. They all pretended they weren't watching the stagnant sun. It might have been psychological, but Hawkeye swore that the trails were becoming thinner and that the forest was closing in inch by sweltering inch. The farther they traveled, the more bizarre it was that there was no sign of any other humans, dead or otherwise. Above, the monkeys kept calling. It was so damn hot, and despite the humidity, he felt his throat going dry. Hawkeye didn't stop walking, but pulled his canteen from his side and lifted the metal vessel to his lips. His eyes closed only briefly as he swallowed, but in that split second, something icy and discordant shuddered across his skin. When he pulled the canteen from his lips and opened his eyes, Ares was gone. The sun was gone too. But somehow, everything was impossibly bright. So bright that it hurt his eyes. But since the light was coming from everywhere, he couldn't even bring his hands up to block the source of it. It made the world flat and unreal. Nothing seemed to have depth. Except for him. Except for him. In the empty pathway where his team should have been stood a figure, dressed almost exactly like Hawkeye himself was. The figure's arms and legs were stiff, standing like a doll propped up on display. His helmet was gone, face bare. Young, almost painfully so, and crushed in a thin film of ice, even in the heat. He was the only thing that felt real, and maybe the only thing that could activate that bone-deep fear in Hawkeye. Cypher moved like a puppet on strings, an animated, empty shadow. Hawkeye tore his eyes away, looking down at his hands. Instead of his canteen, there was a small pistol that he had taken from a dead cyber soldier deep in that frozen place. The barrel was still hot. Hawkeye's heart thundered, and when he dropped the pistol to the forest floor and looked up once more, Cypher was almost to him, still moving in fits and starts. Electrical impulses in a dead thing. Marionette wires on roadkill. Nausea ripped through him like lightning, vomit rocketing up his esophagus, and a migraine exploding in his skull like a firework. He's not me, Cypher screamed in the confines of his mind. And just like that, Hawkeye blinked, and he was back on the path the sun hanging in the sky again. Ares turned to look at him in shock. Hawkeye doubled over and puked on his boots. The sun started to dip below the horizon. They made camp almost exactly four hours later. Hawkeye brushed Aegis off when he was first sick, but when they all settled in for the night, she was finally able to corner him and look him over. She wasn't surprised to find him perfectly healthy, at least physically, because she had her own theories about Hawkeye. In Aegis's opinion, any ailment he might carry was mental, even if he refused to acknowledge it. But in the middle of an assignment wasn't the time or place to bring it up, 
so when she was sure he wasn't going to die on them, she let sleeping dogs lie. As soon as the medic was done with him, Hawkeye took off, crunching an alertness aid between his teeth while he hunted for a tree to take his position in. Sentinel tried to tell him that they would take shifts, but the sniper wasn't hearing it. Any other time, the commander would put his foot down and order him to follow directions. But there was something in the other man's eyes that told Sentinel he needed the time alone. Again, Aegis had her own opinions about that, but she kept them to herself. Ares bivouacked in a small clearing, their vulnerable scientist in the middle. There was no fire, but self-heating MREs crackled and filled the space with the smell of food. Before Aegis was even able to finish, she knew she wasn't going to be able to sleep. Not with the threat of shattering spiders and the constant hooting of the howler monkeys in the canopy above. She wasn't feeling confident about the mission either. Just coming back alive would make Ares the most successful team to be deployed to the Viridian site. But she knew Umbral wanted more. Some charred pieces of chimera and a vial of spider bits weren't going to endear any of them to the upper echelon of the mega corporation. And that was because there was an ugly truth about assignments like this one that nobody ever spoke out loud. Ares wasn't there to discover the fate of the other teams, or even recover them. They were there to ascertain and then incapacitate or destroy whatever had wrecked the earlier teams, and return it to Umbral. It was foolish to think the company cared one bit whether entire teams lived or died. They only cared if they were effective. And Ares was effective. Whatever had stopped the sun before seemed to be over and the stars wheeled overhead like they always did. Aegis checked Howard's hands, made sure there were no other ailments to tend to, and then tried to find at least a few hours of rest. But the monkeys howled, and she found herself staring at the darkened canopy and the shadows that moved there within. She could hear the murmurs of the rest of the team, and the sounds of them shifting on the ground. It shouldn't be so hard to sleep, she thought. They had been forced to bunk down in much more chaotic places, but for some reason, it took a long time before she felt her eyelids start to get heavy. Aegis gave into the pool of sleep, and for some time, floated there happily. She had no idea what time it was when she felt something brushing in the corner of her mouth. Figuring that it was another bug, she swiped it off, but it didn't leave. Instead, whatever it was pushed between her lips and into the hollow of her mouth in a snap so fast that she barely realized what was happening. Aegis came awake in an instant, letting out a muted yelp. Her training had taught her that screaming was likely to only bring more trouble, but there was no way in hell she was able to be silent with something crawling in her mouth. It brought everybody else except for Howard to their feet. And in the dark, none of them could see the medic digging her fingers in between her teeth and trying to pull the mystery assailant out. Her hand didn't close on a wriggling insect, though, but instead, a creeping vine. It had wrapped itself around one of her legs like a python, then around her torso twice before reaching her face. It was quick, but not strong so right when she could feel it trying to push up from the back of her mouth and into her sinuses, she was able to rip it out and snap it into spasming pieces. It came free with a horrendous sensation, and she heaved, tearing the thing off her body with her bare hands until she was awake enough to remember her combat knife. Sentinel, Jester, and Tempest had immediately turned on their lanterns, but when they moved to help, all of them found themselves bound by similar vines. Once the first one was broken by Aegis, the tendrils became relentless in trying to slither up all of their bodies and find a way into their faces. Aegis had stumbled clear of her enemy, but was fighting a panic that she rarely felt while spitting blood that also dribbled from her nostrils. Tempest and her ultra-sharp blade were free first and moved to free Howard, who was only just waking up, 
and covered in more of the plant vines than anyone else. Sentinel pulled the ones assailing him off with snaps and jerks. With his hands occupied, he had to give a verbal cue, but it was immediately understood. Jester, he bit out. On it, the demolition expert responded, and then, I'm going to need at least ten feet, everyone. Let's move. He had decided to forego the knife work and had cracked his breaching pen to life, singeing the vines off his body. Jester laughed darkly when they made a high, keening noise and shriveled away, obviously more affected by the fire than the cuts. He used the same tactic to burn the stragglers away from Aegis, letting her lean her weight on him while she got her bearings. Tempest had Howard free, and the two of them, plus Sentinel, retreated from the wiggling, green snake pit of vines. Aegis shook the shock off, and they all reached the correct distance away as a group. Give me a light, Jester said, and everyone pointed their torches towards the circle where they had been sleeping. Whatever the things that were so desperate to get in their skulls were, snapped and flailed in one mass, like they were trying to form some sort of shape, but unable to decide what. Aegis thought she could see the rough silhouette of a person, then a bear, and a jaguar, but the vines never managed to complete a shape. It was always just the idea of something. In the white shine of their flashlights, Ares watched as Jester pulled the miniature Ampelomette launcher he had only used once before, there in the same jungle months ago, and fired around. It caught the light like a tiny star while it arced through the air, landing on the undulating plant mass and igniting a white-blue punishing fire. She felt the heat of it on her face. The vines screeched and hissed, and the sound of it hurt Aegis's heart as if the things hadn't been trying to probe her brain minutes before. Howard was blathering about a sample, and Tempest jerked a finger-length piece of vine from where it was stuck in her shoelaces. Hawkeye still had the exobiologist pack, though, and with a look of distaste, Howard shoved it in his pocket. They watched the fire for a moment, the self-contained burns dimming soon enough, until it was just embers. All of the team had clipped their helmets to their belts before sleeping, just for situations like this one. Each of them pulled them back on while they listened to Sentinel calling for Hawkeye over the comms. Oh shit. He just came to the realization all at once. He was supposed to be on watch. Yeah, I saw it. She heard Hawkeye growl down the comms. What was I supposed to do? Shoot her in the neck just to take out a vine? Sentinel's jaw was tight. Hawkeye was on thin ice with his commander. No, but you could have warned us. There was the static crackle of silence for a second before Hawkeye responded. It happened in less than a minute. By the time I could have even considered loading an incendiary round, Jester had the whole place on fire. You were distracted. Sentinel insisted, pissed beyond measure. Damn it. Hawkeye let out a rough sigh. Fine. Had you not been in the middle of a situation, I would have called you all over here anyway. You still need to come. There's something that I had my eye on. Aegis could see the moment of hesitation on Sentinel's face, but with a last look at the inferno that Jester had unleashed, he raised his hand and motioned the team into position. They set off for Hawkeye's location without another word. Implicit trust was one of the things that made Ares function as spectacularly as it did. So Sentinel was deciding to trust Hawkeye, even if he had his reasons not to. The team powered off their flashlights, flipping their visors down and activating night vision. Tempest quietly instructed Howard on how to follow suit. They weren't far from where Hawkeye was posted up, and before long, they could see his form in the branches in a tree up ahead, his enormous rifle in position, and aimed towards a small clearing where the jungle gave way. Readying their own rifles, Ares took a knee at the tree line and looked out at whatever had been striking enough to distract their sniper, even for the brief second it had taken the vines to make their move back in camp. 
Hawkeye's voice came over their comms again. They came out of the jungle not too long after I took my post, but didn't move for hours. It wasn't worth noting until just a few minutes ago when... they started moving. That's what caused me to look away. He didn't need to say anything else. They could see what he was referencing. There was a herd of marsh deer, nearly twenty of them, in the clearing, two of them with towering antlers. They were eerily silent, but that wasn't what was strange about them. Aegis held her breath while she watched them move in a shambling, spasmatic walk, backwards. Some threw their heads, snorting, while others managed to paw at the ground restlessly between lurching steps. But other than those few signs of discontent, all they did was trudge backwards, looking terribly wrong. Then, one broke from the pack and bolted forward, trying to escape whatever was happening. It almost made it, but before it could disappear between the trees, it crashed into some invisible barrier. Ares could hear the snap of its spine from where they were, and the pathetic, mewling sound the paralyzed thing made. It disturbed her, but Aegis knew that in the large scheme of things, it meant nearly nothing to them or the mission. Quietly, Sentinel confirmed with Hawkeye that he had gotten a recording of the phenomenon, and told the sniper to come back down and join them so they could go on. The idea of rest was long gone. Something was certainly wrong with this part of the jungle, but she was almost positive that there was nothing left of the previous teams to be found. So, Ares would finish their mission with whatever hours of night and then day was left, as fast as they possibly could. And that's what they were in the process of doing, ignoring the scraping sounds of the deer going backwards and the groans of the paralyzed doe. It was then that those groans changed, so clearly that none of them could deny it. The bleeding changed pitch, and from that long, muscular throat, the deer cried a garbled series of words. More help! More help! Spurts! Aegis felt her stomach roll at the horror of it. Sentinel motioned to Hawkeye to stop his descent, and while the deer cried out, the sniper aimed his rifle and fired a shot. It rang out, impossibly loud in the small clearing, and snuffed out the inhuman cries with it. Tempest told herself that she was unmoved by the sound of a woman's voice coming out of the marsh deer, but she still flinched when Hawkeye sunk a bullet between those wide-spaced eyes and put the thing down. That should have been the end of it, but nothing was ever easy for them. So fast that she was barely able to comprehend it, the same creeping vines from before erupted from beneath their feet, hundreds of them, and they shot forward. Past Ares, past the marsh deer still trudging backwards, and to the fresh corpse of the dead deer. They wrapped the creature up like a mummy, around and around, tight enough to be a second skin. Just like they had tried to do with Aegis, into the deer's mouth, then eyes, ears. The vining tendrils owned the deer, and became it, making it rise on green, shaking legs. Hawkeye shot again, but all he managed was to cut a hole that was immediately covered again by the plants. The possessed deer bucked and launched itself through the crowd of its former peers, bashing its skull into them and knocking them off their backwards path. The night became chaos. Exterminate them all, Sentinel yelled. There was no point in being quiet anymore. Once the deer was knocked off its path, it tried to bolt like the first had, but the ones that were still living couldn't escape the invisible barrier that held them. Not all died when they hit, but when another did, the vines came for it, too. In that way, each creature rose again, and undead, the barrier did not hold them. Everything fell like dominoes. Ares moved like clockwork. Tempest pushed Howard behind her, 
forcing him to his knees and commanding him not to move until she told him to. Then, they opened fire, fanning out across the edge of the clearing, with the goal being to move them into as tight of a cluster as possible so Jester could set them alight. Normal ammo didn't kill the undead, but it pushed them back. It quickly became clear that it wasn't the vine covered deer that were the real danger. They bucked and flailed, but quickly enough the undead took off through the jungle at an astonishing speed, disappearing. Those still living, though, were frantic, one by one that were knocked out of their walking trance. And once all of them were out of the haze, whatever invisible barrier that had held them vanished. With no real way to escape the barrage, Ares took down the still living deer, putting them out of their misery as quickly as possible before more human voices could crawl up their throats. Once the vines had raised them from the dead, they took off, like all the others, bolting mindlessly through the trees. It wasn't until the heavy boom of Hawkeye firing anti-material rounds that any of the vine deer actually fell. He fired the explosive bullet into the center mass of the things, and they exploded, guts and greenery flying. The damage was catastrophic enough to bring them down, and keep them down, but by that time most of them had fled. It was an incredible showing of strength and accuracy that the sniper could fire those rounds from his precarious position in the trees, and he took down five. It would be enough for Umbral to collect anyway. They would have their specimen, and whatever person's voice was inside of them. Tempest tried not to look at the eyes, wide open in death, and oddly human. It was hard not to, though. The sun was rising. Let's get this done, Sentinel said grimly, before whatever's going on here gets too big to manage. They gave Howard five minutes to investigate the bodies, and he looked shaken when he was finished, but said nothing. Ares fell into their normal formation and advanced, all of them more than ready to finish their grid search and call for extraction. Normally, Tempest was glad for a fight, anything to get her blood pumping, but when things slid away from the rules of the world as she knew them, she started to get uncomfortable. She knew how to face an army, but not monsters made from the earth itself. As they hiked, the jungle seemed to close in on them, tighter and tighter. There were trails cut through where the vine deer had fled, and they took advantage of them where possible. Ares stayed prepared, rifles at the ready, and covered as much space as they could with Howard slowing them down. Tempest felt an unease prickle at the back of her neck when she noticed that all the deer trails had converged into one, which meant they were going to where the undead ungulates had fled. She breathed through the fear, settling into herself and the identity that she had created. Fearless, strong, deadly, unbroken. She shut out the howler monkey's hooting, the sound of the wind in the trees, and the croaking of frogs. Tempest lived in the moment, content but alert, until the jungle ended at the bottom of a towering cliff face. It was the smell that hit her first, rot and damp earth. As they got closer, Ares could feel the cool breeze coming from the center of the cliff face, and once they were close enough, they saw the cavern. Half concealed by overgrowth, it might have gone unseen, or at least been skipped over as unimportant if it wasn't for the bodies of the deer at the cave's mouth. All fifteen of the vine deer that had escaped lay crumpled on their sides, the vines that had covered them having peeled away from their bodies and were leading inside. The tendrils stayed connected to the carcasses, though and the deer were hollowed out and desiccated already, like the flora was sucking them dry and feeding into the cave. The cave's yawning darkness seemed to absorb the light, leaving only an inky void. Still, 
she and the rest of the team might have been able to enter just enough to document the place. Maybe have Howard take some scrapings of lichen or something and leave. Except there at the entrance, haphazardly lying in the underbrush, was the first sign of human life. Gear. Body armor, weapons, and even boots, almost identical to what Ares themselves were wearing, all piled up like trash. Wings, Sentinel said heavily. Going in, boss? Jester asked. Sentinel couldn't look away from the gear pile. Yeah, let's do it. The air went from cool to cold once they were inside. The atmosphere thick with a dank smell. It was like the cave absorbed the daylight, and Tempest was glad when Sentinel told them to turn their headlamps on. The light cast long, distorted shadows. But besides the vines twisting and turning as they led farther into the void, there was nothing else to see but stone walls. She was sure that, any minute, Sentinel would tell them to turn around and exit. They only had a small distance to cover before they could call for extraction. If it wasn't for the fucking cave. And unless the other Eclipse team was somewhere inside the cavern, naked, then it was safe to say they were dead. That knowledge was enough, wasn't it? As they advanced further, a low guttural sound reached their ears, a cacophony of low gurgles that echoed through the cavern. It set her teeth on edge, and Sentinel held up his fist to stop them. Up ahead, the cave widened into a chamber, and that's where whatever was making that noise resided. Sentinel gave them another signal. Forward. Arms at the ready. And they moved. Almost in step with one another. A high ceiling towered, dimly lit by their headlamps, and that guttural noise became louder and more insistent. The scent hit her again, this time almost too much to bear. She pressed the back of her hand to her mouth to keep it at bay. Stale sweat, vomit, bile, shit. It was all the worst sense of a human life, tinged with the hot copper of blood. They stopped and Tempest knew somewhere deep in her bones that if she lowered her head to let her light illuminate what was in front of them, it would be something terrible. The urge to just keep looking up was so strong that she almost didn't conquer it. But one by one, the Ares members turned to look at what was the centerpiece of the chamber. Horror clutched at her chest as she was forced to take in the nightmarish sight. Limbs melted into a twisted mass, flesh melding together until it was impossible to distinguish where one body ended and another began. Faces contorted into expressions of agony and pure terror, eyes rolling in their sockets, haunted. There were dozens of them, maybe more than thirty, but there was no way for Tempest to try and decipher body from body. They had found the missing teams. Fuck, she breathed, her voice cracking. Her breath caught in her throat when one of the fused figures stirred, its misshapen form writhing with the painful, unnatural motion. She stepped back involuntarily, but stopped herself, trying her damnedest to hold form with everyone else. Only Howard was truly reacting too terrified to leave the protection of Ares, but too scared to really look at what was in front of him. It spoke to them then, wretched, screams of agony, low moans of misery, and snatches of sentences and pleas to end them, to please just end them. Then the amalgamation shuddered, Tendrils of fused flesh twitching and wriggling like worms in the dirt. It was reaching for them, somehow, but the monstrosity itself couldn't get to them. So instead, the vines did the work for it. With her blade, 
Tempest cut the tendrils out of the air before they could reach her, while the others dodged. One managed to grab Howard by the ankle and pull him to the ground with a thump, but Tempest cut him free, too, and the vines hovered in the air like live wires, impatient but deciding their next move. All the while, the human amalgamation screamed and spoke its agony. She helped Howard to his feet, but he was almost hysteric, babbling and holding his head between his hands. Tempest grabbed him by the shoulders and shook him hard. Get it together, she hissed. You're the expert. Tell us what to do with this thing. Chimera, Howard moaned. It's Chimera, Jester swallowed hard, his hands restless on his rifle. Tempest understood what he was feeling. She wanted to end this thing in front of them too. Every second it lived was a tragedy. It most certainly isn't Chimera, Jester said, deadpan. It is, he insisted, his one eye screwed shut. It's trying to create a hive mind, trying to recreate what it had back on its home world. That's what this is. There was still no forward movement by the monstrosity, so Sentinel asked, Chimera fused these people. What about the vines? Humans can't exist in a colonial organism. Plants, fungi, they can. So Chimera was able to take control. The deer? Aegis breathed, and Howard responded, miserably. All of it. It's infected everything around here. He paused, opening his eye to look up at the thing. It wants us to... Put it down, Sentinel commanded. No fire, kill shots only. Umbral will want the body. So they did. Tempest fighting the vomit in the back of her throat as she aimed and fired shot after shot between the sets of eyes on the monstrosity she could find. Where there was only one eye, she sunk a bullet into each side of it instead. The vines flailed again, but Jester had ignited the breech pen and held them back scorching them as they got too close while the rest of the team put Chimera's failed hive mind to rest. Blood flowed, gore rolling down. The vines that didn't attack curled around the carnage and drank it down like a snake would water. The individuals wailed and bellowed in pain, but piece by piece the amalgamation went still. Gunfire ceased, and it was done. Howard took so many samples that Hawkeye complained about the weight of the pack, but it still wasn't enough. He needed all of the fused human monstrosity, and maybe, if he was lucky, Umbral would bring it back for him. For the time being, though, he had to settle for the pieces he had taken, following Ares out of the cave, his skull pounding so hard that he was shocked his head was still in one piece. When they came face to... faces... With the fusion, he could feel the intense pressure of Chimera trying to press into his consciousness. But the thing it had made was too crude, and whatever parts of it were left in the jungle couldn't forge the same bond with him. When Ares destroyed it, the pressure stopped, but the headache remained. But he would be back at the base soon, and he would be able to shower, take some medicine, and breathe. The light of day felt like a miracle, and he didn't even mind the hooting of the howler monkeys above, feeling the warmth on his face was so blissful. They were loud, though, and had followed them the entire time, calling the same call over and over again. Maybe it was the blood that the Chimera vines had drank, or maybe it was the energy the Chimera was expending on the fusion was free again. But the hoots were clearer this time, longer, more drawn out, two syllables even. Howard looked up into the canopy, saw the shadows of the monkeys there, and when he listened closer, his vision went fuzzy at the edges. Instead of ha ha, 
the Howler monkeys called for him. Howard, Howard, Howard. He clung to that core identity, that breath of a memory that made him who he was or had been. Even as he melted into the mass of it, as his mind stretched and stretched until it was ready to snap, he clung to it. And when he was no more and he became them, he still held it, small and secret in the empty space of his previous existence. They, the monstrosity, felt that identity, small and hard, like a kernel in their teeth, annoying but bearable. They couldn't absorb it, couldn't swallow it down into the acid of a dozen stomachs, but it wasn't that much of a bother. It was why he knew himself even as the bullets pierced the flesh that he had become, snuffing out parts of a hole until they were nothing. But he knew himself, damn it. He knew himself in death. And that was better than nothing. Calvin Green had dreamt of being a hockey player. He had spent his childhood with blades cutting through the ice and his breath fogging the mountain air. Calvin might have made the minor leagues. Hell, he might have been a decent fourth liner in the NHL, had he not caught Umbral's eye. He was a good hockey player, but he was a phenomenal navigator and tracker as well. The talent had first become apparent in the scouts, and it grew to the point that he was being hired as a freelance navigator by local police departments and search organizations. Calvin never figured out where Umbril heard about him first, but by the time he was curious enough to ask that question, his time had run out. At 18, they had taken him from his home and plied him with the same offer they did everyone else. Join us and be rewarded. Don't. You'll pay. And so will your family and considering that they snatched him out of his front yard, he knew that they were serious. That was how Calvin Green, now codenamed Atlas, had ended up on the Eclipse Initiative team, Wings, which led him to be dumped in the jungle to help locate a civilian search team that had vanished. It was so ordinary, as far as Eclipse Initiative jobs went, that he hadn't even blinked at the assignment. Wings was the second Eclipse team to have visited the area. Ares had been there first, but Atlas didn't know a single thing about what the first team had found. He didn't care either. Atlas was a good soldier. They didn't find anything the first night and set up camp far enough away from the original site of Viridian Lab that he felt relatively safe. The dreams had started that night an alien horizon, the sky a sick bruised purple, moons he didn't recognize wheeling across the sky. Along with them was the vast, aching sense of loneliness. It was so intense he woke up, crawling across the ground to one of his squad mates and grabbing their ankle, just to ease that feeling of being so damned alone. The other soldier didn't complain. Through the darkness and the cacophony of singing insects, he heard the other man whisper, I feel it too. It was noon, but the minutes crawled by like hours. Calvin. Calvin. The husk of a voice had been talking to him since the sun rose. It was a sound he could feel against his spine. It didn't take long for the others to notice, but they were dealing with secret demons of their own. 
he tried to pretend like he didn't hear the whispers, and he told himself that the others were humoring him when they didn't mention the way his head would turn suddenly, listening for a noise that was too loud to be real. It bounced around the inside of his head like a pinball. After three more hours, his hands shaking with a fine tremor that wouldn't go away, they found the remains of the search team, or what was left of them. It took them a while to figure out that the twisted shapes in the bushes were human bodies. It was the bright colors of clothing that had given them away. But the numbers were off. There weren't enough bodies to account for how large the civilian team had been. The whispers had gotten louder and louder the closer they had gotten. The words had become clearer. Calvin. 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 Now there was a voice. A thousand voices. All of them speaking together. Atlas. At the edge of the forest, he looked back and saw his team watching him, their eyes wide and horrified. Come, join us, they said. The whispers echoed through his brain. He sounded like his team, the rest of the men and women that he had fought alongside, his friends, his brothers and sisters. Yes, the voices whispered, and the world turned inside out. He was falling. Or rather, the forest was falling around him. The trees collapsed in on themselves, a whirlpool of bark and leaf, the earth sinking into the pit of a vast yawning maw. He stood at the center, the only still point in the madness, as the sky folded itself down like origami and the ground disappeared beneath his feet. The world was gone replaced with a vast and endless darkness. Atlas fell, his arms wrapped around his knees as if to protect himself from the nothing that surrounded him. There was no light, but there was the wet sound of something large, shifting and sucking and shuddering. And between it all, the agonized sound of muffled voices. It smelled like wet earth, and everything echoed. The walls and ceiling were all too close. Beneath his hands, that he placed on the ground to stand, was damp stone. A cave. His hand fumbled against his gear, and he realized he was still wearing his rifle. He had a flashlight on his vest. He found it, his fingers shaking, and flicked it on. The cavern was immense, a vast cathedral, the ceiling far above. There was an alien organic quality to the room, as if the rock had grown around the shape of a great mouth or an egg. The walls were curved and uneven, and they glinted in the weak light. He shone the light down into the depths and saw a shape curled at the bottom. It was enormous, a mass of dark flesh covered in eyes and mouths and grasping hands. He saw hair and clothing and jewelry. And there, all of the eyes focused on him, unblinking. You, the creature hissed and it rose from the pit, its form unfurling, its tentacles reaching up, up, up towards him. Come, Calvin, the creature said, its voice sweet and full of longing. Atlas lifted his gun. He had seen the remains of his friends. He had heard the screaming. No! He opened fire, five shots, and then he was full of sorrow, so vast and overwhelming that it dragged him to his knees. The flesh thing reached, reached and reached until it touched him, just a little. 
At the contact, all the terrible things that had ever existed in the history of time bloomed in his mind. Misery, pure and uncut, pummeled him. Then the loneliness, hollowing him out, making him scream with the need to belong. Oh God, he thought, I need, I need, I need to be with it. I need to be in it. I need to become part of it. I need to go home. Then the creature let him go, and his vision swam. He felt the thing moving within his head. A few moments later, the creature spoke, its voices a thousand, a million. Come, Calvin. We can save your team. He didn't move. Come, Calvin. I know the way out. And Atlas knew the way out, too. He could see it. The map clear in his head. A path that he could follow. He could get his team out. He could save them. They were screaming. And he was the only one left. The others had already been taken. The monster calling their names and the poor souls had fallen into the pit and let it take them. They had melted into the creature, a new layer, a new organ, a new set of limbs. They had begged him to join them. Atlas shook. He had fought, his bullets tearing the creature open, but the wounds had healed. No. His five desperate shots had ricocheted off stone, like he had been compelled to miss. And the more the creature had taken, the more its voices had changed. It was still them. He recognized the sound of his friends, the cadence of their speech. He had known his team well. It had been hard not to. They had spent so much time together in the Eclipse Initiative, living and fighting and training until they were almost seamless. They had become a family, and now they were calling him, begging him. No, he yelled, his voice rough and raw. He heard the thing sigh. You know you have no choice, Calvin. You will fall, you will melt and be reborn, and you will know bliss. It's time to come home now. Home, he whispered, and he closed his eyes. He remembered a time years ago, before the jungle, when he had been happy and he had not known fear. He heard his team calling his name, pleading. But it was the memory of his mother singing to him, her voice low and soft that he held on to, as the creature rose out of the pit. Calvin. The monster whispered, its voices a thousand. Calvin. He remembered her, his mother, her voice a balm, and he remembered his childhood and the ice and the blades, the slap of a puck echoing off the mountainside. No, he whispered. Not this time. The monster loomed above him, and he lifted his rifle and fired. And as the last bullet hit its mark, as he felt the world folding in on itself, his body falling into the darkness, his mother's song was still in his ears. It's time to go home, he said, the words barely a breath his voice a whisper. Home. Home. The monster chanted. His hand slipped away from the gun and he smiled. Never alone. Atlas's hand brushed the ground and his fingertips trailed across the dirt and stone. Then his hand dissolved, sank inward, and Chimera wrapped him inside itself. Calvin Green, codename Atlas, breathed his last, 
and the universe moved on, unbothered. Chimera inhaled hundreds of different mouths and gills at once, and then let their air whoosh out again. The node they had tried to craft, an amalgamation of humans, was dead, ended by something so familiar, the same group of minds that had taken him from Viridian in the first place. And Howard. Always Howard. There at Chimera's darkest hours, and if they had their way, at their true rebirth too. But for now, Chimera let the pain of loss roll over them. The Viridian node loss feeling like a burning excision. It hurt, but they were so new at this. Born into a hive mind of millions. Now, trying to craft their own. It was agony. Chimera pulled away from the Viridian node, the mass of flesh and blood and bone, but stopped at the last second. There was something left, a little jewel of self hovering there in the void. One of their additions had, apparently, been strong enough to cling to their individual identity till the very end, curled in on itself and nearly gone, but intact. Curious, Chimera reached out and absorbed the little jewel. Calvin Green flowed into Chimera, and like rain sinking into the sand, he was consumed. <laughs>